Steph. 386 Republic 3. Socrates, Adimantus. The Discouraging Lessons of Mythology. Such then, I said, are our principles of theology, some tales are to be told, and others are not to be told to our disciples from their youth upwards, if we mean them to honor the gods and their parents, and to value friendship with one another. Yes, and I think that our principles are right, he said. But if they are to be courageous, must they not learn other lessons besides these, and lessons of such a kind as will take Bawi the fear of death? Can any man be courageous who has the fear of death in him? Certainly not, he said. And can he be fearless of death, or will he choose death in battle rather than defeat and slavery, who believes the world below to be real and terrible? Impossible. The description of the world below in Homer. Then we must assume a control over the narrators of this class of tales as well as over the others, and beg them not simply to revile but rather to commend the world below, scintimating to them that their descriptions are untrue, and will do harm to our future warriors. That will be our duty, he said. Then, I said, we shall have to obliterate many obnoxious passages, beginning with the verses. I would rather be a serf on the land of a poor and portionless man than rule over all the dead who have come to not one. We must also expunge the verse, which tells us how Pluto feared. D. Lest the mansions grim and squalid which the gods abhor should be seen both of mortals and immortals too. 69. And again. O oh heavens! Verily in the house of Hades there is soul and ghostly form but no mind at all three. Again of Tiresias. To him even after death did Persephone grant mind, that he alone should be wise, but the other souls are flitting shades for. Again. The soul flying from the limbs had gone to Hades, lamenting her fate, leaving manhood and youth five. Again. 387 and the soul, with shrilling cry, pass like smoke beneath the earth six. And. As bats in hollow of mystic cavern, whenever any of them is dropped out of the string and falls from the rock, fly shrilling and cling to one another, so did they with shrilling cry hold together as they moved seven. Be such tales to be rejected and we must beg Homer and the other poets not to be angry if we strike out these and similar passages, not because they are unpoetical or unattractive to the popular ear, but because the greater the poetical charm of them, the lesser they meet for the ears of boys and men who are meant to be free, and who should fear slavery more than death. 1 O.D. 11, 489 2 I.L. 20, 64. 3 IL. 23, 103. 4 OD. X, 495. 5 IL. 16, 856. 6 IB, 23. 100. 7 O.D. 24, 6. Undoubtedly. Also we shall have to reject all the terrible and appalling names which describe the world below Cositis and Styx, coasts under the earth, and sapless shades, and any similar words of which the very mention causes a shudder to pass through the inmost soul of him who hears them. I do not say that these horrible stories may not have a use of some kind but there is a danger that the nerves of our guardians may be rendered too excitable and effeminate by them. There is a real danger, he said. Then we must have no more of them. True. Another and a nobler strain must be composed and sung by us. 70. Clearly. 
D. And shall we proceed to get rid of the weepings and wailings of famous men? They will go with the rest. The effeminate and pitiful strains of famous men, and yet more of the gods, must also be banished. But shall we be right in getting rid of them? Reflect, our principle is that the good man will not consider death terrible to any other good man who is his comrade. Yes, that is our principle. And therefore he will not sorrow for his departed friend as though he had suffered anything terrible? He will not. Such an one, as we further maintain, is sufficient for himself and his own happiness, and therefore is least in need of other men. True, he said. And for this reason the loss of a son or brother, or the deprivation of fortune, is to him of all men least terrible. Assuredly. And therefore he will be least likely to lament, and will bear with the greatest equanimity any misfortune of this sort which may befall him. Yes, he will feel such a misfortune far less than another. Then we shall be right in getting rid of the lamentations of famous men, and making them over to women, and not 388 even to women who are good for anything, or to men of a baser sort, that those who are being educated by us to be the defenders of their country may scorn to do the like. That will be very right. Such are the laments of Achilles and Priam, then we will once more entreat Homer and the other poets not to depict Achilles eight, who is the son of a goddess, first lying on his side, then on his back, and then on his face, then starting up and sailing in a frenzy along the shores of Beeth Barren Sea, now taking the sooty ashes in both his hands nine and pouring them over his head, or weeping and wailing in the various modes which Homer has delineated. Nor should he describe Priam the kinsman of the gods as praying and beseeching. Rolling in the dirt, calling each man loudly by his name ten. Seventy-one. Still more earnestly will we beg of him at all events not to introduce the gods lamenting and saying, See alas! My misery! Alas! That I bore the bravest to my sorrow eleven. And of Zeus when he beholds the fate of Hector or Sarpedon. But if he must introduce the gods, at any rate let him not dare so completely to misrepresent the greatest of the gods, as to make him say, O oh heavens! With my eyes verily I behold a dear friend of mine chased round and round the city, and my heart is sorrowful twelve. Or again, Woe is me that I am fated to have Sarpedon, dearest of men to me, subdued at the hands of Patroclus the son of Menoetius thirteen. For if, my sweet Adimantus, our youth seriously listen to such unworthy representations of the gods, instead of laughing at them as they ought, hardly will any of them deem that he himself, being but a man, can be dishonored by similar actions, neither will he rebuke any inclination which may arise in his mind to say and do the like. And instead of having any shame or self-control, he will be always whining and lamenting on slight occasions. 8 IL 24, 10 9 IB, 18 23 10 IB, 22 414 11 IL 18, 54 12 IB, 22 168 13 IB, 16, 433. E yes, he said, that is most true. Yes, I replied, but that surely is what ought not to be, as the argument has just proved to us, and by that proof we must abide until it is disproved by a better. It ought not to be. Neither are the guardians to be encouraged to laugh by the example of the gods. Neither ought our guardians to be given to laughter. For a fit of laughter which has been indulged to excess almost always produces a violent reaction. 
so I believe. Then persons of worth, even if only mortal men, must not be represented as overcome by laughter, and still less must such a representation of the gods be allowed. 389 Still less of the gods, as you say, he replied. Then we shall not suffer such an expression to be used about the gods as that of Homer when he describes how. Inextinguishable laughter arose among the blessed gods, when they saw Hephaestus bustling about the mansion 14. On your views, we must not admit them. 72. 14 IB, I of 599. On my views, if you like to father them on me, that we must not admit them as certain. Our youth must be truthful, again, truth should be highly valued, if, as we were saying, a lie is useless to the gods, and useful only as a medicine to men, then the use of such medicine should be restricted to physicians, private individuals have no business with them. Clearly not, he said. Then if anyone at all is to have the privilege of lying, the rulers of the state should be the persons, and they, in their dealings either with enemies or with their own citizens, may be allowed to lie for the public good. But nobody else should meddle with anything of the kind, and although the rulers have this privilege, for a private man to lie to them in return is to be deemed a more heinous fault than for the patient or the pupil of a gymnasium not to speak the truth about his own bodily illnesses to the physician or to the trainer, or for a sailor not to tell the captain what is happening about the ship and the rest of the crew, and how things are going with himself or his fellow sailors. Most true, he said. D.F. Then, the ruler catches anybody beside himself lying in the state. Any of the craftsmen, whether he be priest or physician or carpenter 15. He will punish him for introducing a practice which is equally subversive and destructive of ship or state. 15 O.D. 17, 383 S.Q. Most certainly, he said, if our idea of the state is ever carried out 16. 16 or, if his words are accompanied by actions. And also temperate. In the next place our youth must be temperate? Certainly. Are not the chief elements of temperance, speaking ye generally, obedience to commanders and self-control and sensual pleasures? True. Then we shall approve such language as that of Diomede in Homer. Friend, sit still and obey my word 17, 73. And the verses which follow. The Greeks marched breathing prowess 18, in silent awe of their leaders 19. And other sentiments of the same kind. 17 IL 4, 412 18 OD 3, 8